Hello and welcome to the lecture on viruses, viroids, and prions. There are a couple movies in here that we are not going to be able to watch because Keynote does not allow me to play video within recording a video. So I will add links to those to the same folder that this is in so you can take a look at those videos later on. All right, so overall, viruses. Viruses are non-living. They are considered acellular, intracellular pathogens. Uh, they must gain entry into a host cell in order to cause disease. Their main purpose is, of course, not to cause disease, but to take over this, the molecular machinery of the cell in order to replicate. So they need to make more copies of their own genetic material, build their proteins, and enter uh, enter into the system to invade more host cells just to simply make more viruses. Uh, viroids are small little naked pieces of RNA. They cause disease in plants. We don't really see any or know of any viroids that cause disease in humans. There's a couple that cause disease in insects. So they are capable of entering into animal cells, not just plant cells, but for the most part they are uh, plant viruses. Then we have pri uh, prions, which are not really viruses at all, they are proteins, and they are a glycoprotein that has folded to a more stable state and has changed its function from one to be beneficial to the cell uh, to uh, being detrimental. In viral taxonomy, we have to, of course, uh, classify different viruses, families of viruses. So family names always end in viridae, genus names always end in virus, and a viral species will be determined by the host the species of the host that it, uh, that it infects or invades, as well as genetic similarities. There are subspecies, unlike uh, animal taxonomy, where we end with species. When we get into uh, virology or even in microbiology in general, we start to, uh, because of common genetic differences, we have to start moving into subspecies and sub subspecies, and it can start getting quite complicated when we try to get down to an individual subspecies of virus. When viruses are classified in general, they are classified by their nucleic acid type, whether they're an RNA virus or a DNA virus, and their replication mechanism. In RNA and DNA viruses, there's types, two different types of replication mechanisms. One is called a positive sense and the other one is called a negative sense. We're not going to get into that here, but there are different forms of replication. And then, of course, the shape of the virus, the morphology. So viruses are genetic material surrounded by a protein coat called a capsid. The capsid is made up of small protein units called capsomeres, and they create a vessel that'll carry this genetic information from one cell to another. The genetic information found in viruses will be RNA or DNA, but it'll never be both. Uh, viruses will have spikes. Our cells have receptors. Uh, and these receptors are used by cells to sense what's going on in the environment for uptake of different nutrients for endocytosis, etc. So viruses take advantage of this, this uh, receptor system that we have, and they have glycoproteins on their surface that are uh, called spikes. And viral spikes will be unique, and they will be specific to, the, to a specific receptor on different cell types. So virus spikes are complementary to cellular receptors, and that is how they are able to enter some cells and not in others. The spikes from viruses can be found either directly attached to the capsid or for animal viruses that are enveloped, those spikes will be um, uh, embedded in the actual membrane or in that, that envelope. Most viruses are very specific to the types of cells that they infect. If you are infected by, we used uh, in class, we talked about hepatitis. So if you're infected with the hepatitis virus, it's only going to infect liver cells because only liver cells contain the receptors that the viral spikes on the hepatitis virus are specific for. Uh, the host range that uh, viruses can infect is going to be determined by those spikes and attachment sites. Viruses come in a pretty big range of sizes and shapes. This diagram in the top right here, you can see that there's uh, several viruses just trying to compare to the size of a bacterial cell versus a red blood cell. Uh, there is another class of viruses called bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are viruses that attack bacteria. So they are referred to 
uh, just regular uh, nomenclature. We just call them phages. A complete, mature, ready to infect uh, viral particle is called a virion. So you'll hear the term mature virion. And again, composed of some kind of genetic material that is surrounded by some kind of coat made out of proteins. DNA or RNA, never both. This genetic material can be single stranded, it can be double stranded. Uh, sometimes it's in a circular form, sometimes it's linear, sometimes it's in multiple pieces, sometimes it's one big giant piece, and how much genetic material is within a specific virus is going to be dependent on the actual species of virus. So it is what we call virus specific. The capsid and envelope found on the outside of viruses, the capsid is uh, composed of proteins and these pro individual proteins that make up the capsid are called capsomeres. The envelope is a lipid protein complex. Usually in animal viruses, which are the enveloped viruses, they will uh, get their membrane by budding out of a cell or out of an organelle. They'll get their membrane from, from the actual cell itself. The membrane will most often have spikes embedded in it. Uh, viruses with envelopes are viruses with these membranes are called uh, enveloped. If not, they are if they are not enveloped, they are called naked. I want to draw your attention to this diagram in the middle, just showing you, this is just a visual of all the different structures of a virus. We can see the, the yellow noodly thing in the middle, and that is uh, the genetic material surrounded by the orange coating, which is the capsid, and then that greenish coating, which is the envelope. So this is an enveloped virus. It's an animal virus. It has two spikes. Uh, so cells that will uptake this virus will have two receptors that these two spikes are specific for. We have the hemagglutinin spike and the neuraminidase spike. This is the H and the N in the naming of flu viruses. So this is a flu virus. So H1N1, H5N3, H1N3. We name flu viruses, subspecies of flu viruses, based on the combination of spikes that are found within that virus. Okay, so here are just some pictures of enveloped viruses. Um, we see in the top left there, I believe that's another flu virus. We've got the herpes simplex virus, Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus is associated with mononucleosis. Of course, herpes, uh, most people are pretty familiar with. Down in the bottom right, we have a picture of a flu virus. And uh, I like this diagram because it shows entry of the flu virus into the cell, which is at the top, right? Flu virus penetrates cell membrane. It is taken up into the cell, and once it starts uh, transcribing and translating, starts uh, uh, using its genetic blueprint to make new virus parts, some of those virus parts for a flu virus include the spikes, that uh, hemagglutinin spike and that neuraminidase spike. Those two spikes have got to be available in some kind of membrane for that flu virus to coat itself with so that those spikes are facing the outside and new mature virions can then go out into the environment, come into contact with new cells and enter into these new cells. So in this case, the flu virus, when it, when it builds these spikes, when it, it uh, uses the host ribosome to create these protein spikes, these spikes will move, they'll get processed in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. They will move through the Golgi apparatus and the Golgi apparatus will tag them for in being embedded in the actual cell membrane itself. And when the capsid containing the genetic material is assembled and matured, the flu virus will bud out of the cell, taking some of the cell membrane with it and that cell membrane will contain the viral spikes. So that by the time it buds out of the cell, the membrane and viral spikes are now surrounding or coating that capsid, and the flu virus is ready for entry into another cell. So here we see in this diagram, the flu virus penetrates the membrane, it gets released into the cell and starts making new parts, and then the host cell produces new flu viruses, and we can see those viruses budding out of the cell and that the cell membrane is coated and all of those viral spikes, those little uh, dark pink and blue spikes are all the viral spikes that are going to be part of the, the envelope as that flu virus buds out. 
viruses do come in all kinds of different shapes. We have the parainfluenza virus. Here in the top right, we have the rabies virus. Looks like a honeycomb. Uh, and then at the bottom, a very large and very famous virus, the Ebola virus. Uh, the Ebola virus is notorious for that two, that double loop. They call it a double knot. That's in the, the um, capsid. Viruses that are non-enveloped oftentimes are very geometric. We have the adenovirus down at the bottom there. Uh, that's a, an icosahedral. It has 20 different sides. In the top, we have the polio virus. And what's really cool about this picture is you can see those viral spikes sticking up off of that polio virus. The polio virus is incredibly small. And then over on the right, we have the bacteriophage. These are T4 bacteriophages. They are specific to E. coli, but there are other bacteriophages out there that are specific to other, um, other bacteria. So let's talk a little bit about these virus, these bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are sometimes referred to as complex viruses. I like to use the term phage more often because I want you to keep bacteriophages separate from animal viruses. Although they have many similarities, they have a lot of differences. And bacteriophages are specific to bacteria. Viruses are going to be specific uh, to animal cells and plant cells or eukaryotic cells. So make sure when you're reading questions on your exam or in your quizzes that you are paying attention to whether you are being asked about a phage or bacteriophage and whether or not you're being asked about an animal virus. Okay, so back to lecture here. So uh, bacteriophages, also known as complex viruses, are capsids that have additional structures. Bacteriophages are not enveloped. They do not have an envelope. Uh, and the capsid is attached to a sheath, a base plate with pins, and these tail fibers. And the tail fibers work kind of like the viral spikes. Tail fibers will um, attach to the outside of the bacterial cell, and when they are attached correctly, they will bend. Those tail fibers will bend and push down the base plate and pins. The pins will, uh, the bacteriophage will release lysozyme to weaken the cell wall, and those pins will cause penetration across the cell wall. The sheath then punctures the cell wall, and the genetic material is inserted into the cell. This is done kind of like a hypodermic needle. In the bottom right, we have a pox virus. This is kind of an anomaly in animal viruses, but pox viruses do not have the protein capsid. In order to study viruses, use viruses for anything, we have to be able to grow them. But viruses don't grow on their own because they are, they are acellular, they're not living. So we have to actually grow a cell culture and then use the cell culture for viral replication. Uh, bacteriophages are grown in, of course, bacteria, and they are grown on a lawn of bacteria. So in this picture, you can see what are called plaques. Plaques are actually where bacteria have died due to, <clears throat> excuse me, due to phage infection. So if I want to study or utilize this particular uh, uh, species of bacteriophage, I'm going to grow the bacteria it's specific for. I'm going to mix that bacteria with the actual phage. I'm going to spread that bacteria or pour that bacteria onto a plate, and I'm going to allow the, the bacteriophage to kill some of the cells. That tells me where the phages are located on this plate. I can then go in and with an with a, uh, inoculating loop and, and aseptically remove bacteria surrounding the plaque. That bacteria and agar surrounding the plaque will will contain the, the, uh, the bacteriophage that I'm looking for. If I want to grow animal viruses, I can do it in one of two ways. I can, uh, most viruses are uh, animal viruses used in the pharmaceutical industry for vaccine purposes are usually grown either in a living animal, which is, can be unethical if it's going to make the animal sick, uh, or they can be grown in embryonated eggs. Eggs are the most common form of, uh, or most common vessel in which viruses are grown, and they're used mostly to manufacture vaccines. Uh, for example, the flu virus is always grown in eggs. Some viruses can be grown in a host but don't cause disease, and so here in the embryonated eggs, uh, in the bottom right, we can see there are uh, all kinds of different places inside of an embryonated egg that we can, we can grow these different viruses. Now, the egg is going to be inviolable. It's, it's not going to hatch into a chicken. 
Uh, and they're not going to grow more than one virus in a single egg, but that diagram is just simply there to show you there are lots of different areas within an egg that can be injected with virus so the virus can be grown. Now growing animal and plant viruses, we have to use a cell culture. Uh, we can oftentimes maintain a cell line for an extended or indefinite period of time, so we just keep replicating these cells due to mitosis. Uh, and the current method is to use HeLa cells, which are uh, cancerous cells. Now, when cell cultures are grown, a few things to know about cell cultures. Uh, cell cultures are not grown in big chunks. We have to actually separate the cells from the, cyto, the uh, exos exoskeleton. So the tissue that is going to be used, the initial cell culture that the tissues are derived from, has to be treated with a bunch of enzymes in order to break down that extracellular matrix and allow the cells to be to float around or be free. They are then poured into a plate with some culture medium, uh, oxygenated and nutrients, those sorts of things. And the cells, they'll get suspended. And when human cells or uh, tissue, these, these individual cells start growing in culture, animal cells will only grow in a single layer. So we, there will only be one layer thick. Cells that are transformed either through virus or cancer or mutation they are going to grow in a lump. They'll grow on top of each other. Healthy cells will only grow in a single layer. Transformed cells will grow in um, a large lump. So we can take a look and just look at the cytopathic effects of the viral infection or changes in cellular behavior or growth and determine which cells are viral infected and which are not. We then can extract the viral infected cells and then get the virus out of those cells for whatever we're going to use that virus for. This transformation of cells is known as a cytopathic effect. It's uh, here with viruses, it's the deterioration of normal cells, but cytopathic effects can be seen in cancer cells, uh, bacteria infected cells, those sorts of things. It's just talking about changes in cellular behavior or structure function. How do we know what virus is present? What virus is infecting something? How do we, how do we figure out uh, what virus is causing a disease in a patient? Uh, there are a couple of different ways. Uh, tissue biopsies can be put through uh, electron microscopy or just looking at it under a light microscope after staining, seeing if there are cytopathic effects to the cells. In the top left, I mean, I'm sorry, top right there, you can see what normal mouse cells may look like. And then on the right, those same cells after a virus infection. That's an example of a cytopathic effect. There's definitely a major change in cellular structure. We can also use serological tests where antibodies are used. Uh, we, in a similar manner that we talked about in antibody fluorescent microscopy. So antibodies can be tagged and those antibodies would be specific for viruses. We lyse open cells expose the, the cell culture to these labeled antibodies, take a look and see if these antibodies are present. We can also use nucleic acid. This is the uh, nucleic acid identification or uh, DNA. Genetic material is the, material is the preferred method for uh, identification of viruses. Viruses do have unique genetic sequences. So we can use uh, what's called PCR, polymerase chain reaction to identify or locate those genes. Uh, we will learn more about PCR in the next unit, but for now, PCR is a way for us to kind of sort through uh, a whole bunch of genetic material and find very, very unique sequences. We know ahead of time what those sequences are, so that tells us if that sequence is present and it's a sequence that's associated with a specific virus, then we know that that specific virus is present. So we're basically looking for the blueprint of the virus itself. Now viruses go through a one-step growth curve and one of the, uh, in an acute infection. And one of the problems with viral infections is that they're intracellular obligates. This means that in order for the virus to be detected, it's got to be outside of the cell. If we're going to take a blood sample and look for these viruses without lysing open any cells, we're not going to see any very shortly after exposure. And this is primarily because the viruses enter into what's referred to as an eclipse period. The, the virus is being eclipsed by the fact that it has to gain entry inside of cells. So for a short period of time, these viruses are going to be inside of our cells 
and they're going to be going through that process of replication of transcription and translation, assembly, maturation. They're going to be going through a, a part of their life cycle that occurs inside of the cell before they are released out into the environment. So while they're inside of the cell kind of uh, uh, getting things going, we're not really going to see many viruses out in the bloodstream or outside of cells. So they can be difficult to detect. During the eclipse period, the cell is, has been taken over by the virus and all of the mRNA in, this, in the cell, all of the uh, enzymes and proteins associated with, with genetic replication, RNA production, uh, protein synthesis, all of that machinery is now completely devoted to viral replication. If a virus successfully takes over a cell, it will devote all of the cell's functions to viral replication everything else in the cell will cease. So it won't function the way that it should. So after the eclipse period, vir virions are now mature, so they're now being released out of the cells. As the virions become exposed to the extracellular environment, the host's immune system is going to start responding. So the patient will, will move into an acute infection state. Uh, once they're at the height of an acute infection, this is usually when the, the immune system is at its strongest and is uh, at its most aggressive. People don't feel so great, but once the immune system starts to get things under control, then the, of course the viral load is then going to start going down because the immune system is destroying or neutralizing those viruses. Now, in addition to an acute infection, in viral infections, there are also latent and persistent uh, latent viral infections, the virus remains asymptomatic uh, for a very long period of time. The patient can have recurring outbreaks or maybe only one or two outbreaks, but they will have the, the viral will be in their system for the rest of their lives. So chicken pox is a latent viral infection. Later in life, people will develop shingles. Uh, cold sores, the herpes cold sores are also latent viral infections. Persistent viral infections are ones that uh, prese uh, present themselves over a long period of time. Persistent viral infections are also referred to as chronic. The person never really truly is asymptomatic. Usually they don't feel so great and it just progresses over time. Hepatitis, uh, untreated HIV. It'll start out with an acute infection and that acute stage will be either very short-lived or it could just never really come all the way back down to recovery. They just kind of, they'll get better and then just over, gradually over time will feel worse and worse and worse or the viral load will get higher and higher and higher. And eventually in some of these, it oftentimes is the, is the final cause of death. Not always, not always, but sometimes. So let's start talking about bacteriophages. Now, bacteriophages have two basic life cycles. They have what's called a lytic cycle and a lysogenic cycle. In the lytic cycle, we have five basic steps of this replication cycle. First, the virus has to attach and try to follow the diagram down at the bottom. So that top circle there, the virus particle, that's attachment and penetration. So the virus particle attaches to the outside of the bacterial cell, injects its genetic material, and then in the next, uh, follow that arrow, in the next one we have uh, penetration, so the DNA is now being replicated. It's inside of the cell and we're moving into biosynthesis. In biosynthesis, we have replication of the viral genetic material, but we also have uh, transcription. So uh, viral replication is part of uh, DNA replication. And, but in order for all of this to occur, we still have to follow the blueprint of the virus itself. The whole point here is to make new, new phages, right? Bacteriophages want to make more phages. So the phage DNA encodes for, for, to the cell how to do that. But it does not want the cell to devote any energy to its own DNA. It wants the cell to devote everything to the viral DNA. So the host, the phage DNA will initially encode for some enzymes that will break up bacterial DNA. Bacterial DNA structurally is just a little bit different from viral DNA. 
bacterial DNA has uh, some methyl groups on the outside of it. So those enzymes will look for what's referred to as methylated DNA. And this is one of the ways that these viral enzymes can distinguish between viral or phage DNA and bacterial DNA. So they look for these little minute kind of structural differences between the two and that way they can they know which one to destroy. The host DNA you can see there that little gray piece of DNA it's all broken up into a bunch of pieces and the phage DNA is being replicated and also transcribed and translated. We move to the next step in maturation. In maturation our Viral, our bacteriophage particles are all being assembled, assembled. So the phage DNA is being inserted into the capsid. The, capsids, the capsomeres are coming together and forming the capsid. The sheath and tail fibers, pins and base plate, all of the different parts that make up these bacteriophages are all being assembled, assembled into finalized mature uh, phages. Eventually, we move to the last step, which is release. And in the last step, the bacteriophage will uh, encode for some lysozymes and lysozymes will again weaken the cell wall to the point that it will finally burst open or lyse open, hence the name lytic cycle. And the new mature bacteriophages will then exit out of the cell to go and infect new cells. The second process here is known as the lysogenic cycle. And in the lysogenic cycle, the lytic cycle will be part of it. But um, just after attachment and penetration, we have kind of a, a detour. So the bacteriophage will take a detour and instead of chopping up the host DNA into a million pieces, it will just simply cut it once and insert its own genetic material into the genome of the bacterial cell. And it will stay there and lay dormant. It will not move into replication for an extended period of time. And then eventually it will excise itself out and move back into the lytic cycle for replication. We have a, I have a couple diagrams. We'll go over those in a minute. So here are our five steps, just definitions of the five steps of the lytic cycle. Attachment, penetration, biosynthesis, maturation, and release. Now, the lysogenic cycle. Over here on the right, I want you to see where that bacteriophage is sitting on top of that bacterial cell. That blue line is the genome of the bacteriophage. And in the second copy of the cell, we can see that the DNA from the phage has been inserted and attached to the DNA of the bacterial cell. When a phage inserts its genetic material into the bacterial cell, it is now referred to as a prophage. So when you hear the term prophage, you're talking about a lysogenic cycle. Uh, when we are in, a, when a phage is in a prophage state, it's going to be inactive. Now it enters the cell and starts the lytic cycle, but then after attachment and penetration moves into that prophage step. The inserted phage is now referred to as a prophage. A prophage is genetic material and we it does not want the bacterial cell to necessarily transcribe and translate it. Remember, this is A, T, C, and G, both in the, the bacterial DNA and the phage DNA. So but if there's no repressors or no way to regulate that genetic material from the prophage, it's just going to go straight into a lytic cycle because it's just going to make copies and copies of its own genetic material. So a prophage will either bring proteins with it or will allow for some low-level transcription in order to build the proteins need, needed for genetic repression. Genetic repression is when proteins, enzymes usually, will sit on the surface. They'll attach to the DNA and prevent transcription and translation of that genetic material. So they're known as repressor proteins. Every time the bacterial cell, however, every time the bacterial cell goes through binary fission, it's going to replicate its DNA. And since this prophage is now part of the host genome, that prophage DNA will also be replicated. So every consequent uh, cell division that occurs, every time binary fission occurs, a binary fission event, we go from one prophage infected cell to two prophage infected cells. Now those two cells are going to go into binary fission again. 
Remember, growth in bacteria is exponential, so we're going to continue uh, this division process. And we can go from a single prophage infected, infected bacterial cell to uh, an entire population of prophage infected cells. At some point in time, at some point in time, this prophage is going to be stimulated by some kind of environmental or external stimulus, but it's going to be signaled to excise or be cut back out of the host genome in order to move back into the lytic cycle. There are bacterial cells that may remain as a prophage for their entire life cycle, but um, somewhere down the road, this prophage is going to pop out and it's going to move into a lytic cycle and become a mature virion again. Now here's a nice diagram that really shows the lysogenic cycle well. And on the left we have the lytic cycle and on the right we have the lysogenic. And what I want you to get from this is that they are related. They are kind of codependent on each other to some extent. Not all bacteriophages are lysogenic. Keep that in mind. Many bacteriophages are lytic cycle only. Okay, lytic cycle only. So a phage will attach to a host cell, inject its DNA. You can see that in step one. In step two, the little red two there, um, we see the viral DNA or the phage DNA on the left in hot pink, and we see the host DNA, the bacterial DNA on the right. It's at this point in time that this phage DNA has kind of has to make a decision or do something, and it's either going to go to the left into the lytic cycle, maturation or biosynthesis maturation and uh, release, or it's going to become a prophage and enter into the lysogenic cycle. So after penetration and attachment is where our, our phage is going to figure out which way it's going to go. Is it going to go uh, into the lytic cycle or is it going to go and become a prophage in the lysogenic cycle? If it turns into a prophage, we can see in step 4b there that uh, uh, the bacteria will reproduce normally through binary fission, causing multiple cell divisions and we get this whole population of bacteria that are prophage infected. But at some point in time, the prophage is going to be excised out of the bacterial chromosome. This is um, going to initiate that, that phage DNA to move into the lytic cycle. Now, there are three things that occur in lysogeny, which is a lysogenic cycle. In lysogeny, the first is reinfection immunity. In reinfection immunity, uh, a host cell cannot be infected twice by the same species of phage. And this is because when phage DNA incorporates into the host genome, it is not a random event. And what I mean by that is that it doesn't just find a place and stick its DNA into the host DNA. It is going to be looking for a specific sequence. That's one of the things that makes these uh, phages uh, uh, species or host specific. So it's going to be looking for a very specific genetic sequence that it will use to insert itself into the host DNA. If that sequence already has uh, phage DNA or a prophage is already present in that spot, it cannot insert another prophage. So host cells are, uh, they have reinfection immunity if they're in a, a lysogenic state. Also, we have phage conversion. Depending on where that, that prophage is inserted, there are sometimes new properties that a host cell will have due to this infection. And the, lysogenic, uh, the lysogenic phage uh, in diphtheria is where the toxin actually gets produced. So, uh, it's important to understand that cells will go through changes even in a, in a lysogenic state. We think of it as this dormant and the cell is, is perfectly normal, but there are oftentimes cytopathic effects even to lysogeny. The last is one of the three forms of what we refer to as horizontal gene exchange. In horizontal gene exchange, bacteria will trade or switch or swap uh, genetic material in order to promote genetic diversity. And they do this one of three ways, either conjugation, uh, transformation, or through viral exchange in a, pro in a process known as transduction. Now transduction occurs in one of two ways. We have a what's called um, specialized transduction and we have what's called generalized transduction. 
In specialized transduction, we, uh, this requires the lysogenic cycle. General transduction is, occurs during the lytic cycle. Now, a binary fission during lysogeny causes lots and lots of new cells to contain uh, viral genetic material, and this is known as transduction. However, when a prophage excises itself out of a bacterial genome, when a prophage does this, it oftentimes, or well, sometimes it makes a mistake. This is known as an excision error. And it will take a little bit of the host DNA and incorporate it into that new prophage DNA that's been excised out of the genome. This extends the prophage DNA with a little bit of host DNA. And if that host DNA contains a gene that is, that is usable by the next cell, then we have transmission of genetic material. So this diagram here is a, um, a bacterial cell. Uh, we're looking at genetic exchange through specialized transduction. So let's start with step number one. In step number one, we have a, a bacterial cell that is in lysogeny, meaning a prophage is present. It's been infected by a bacteriophage, and that bacteriophage has moved, once the genetic material entered into the cell, had moved into a uh, lysogenic cycle. So it is a prophage. So the prophage DNA here is in pink, and where the prophage inserted itself into the host DNA is right up against a gene for fermentation of a sugar known as galactose. So this is the uh, donor cell. And this whole population of cells, this uh, prophage goes through cell divisions, all those sorts of things, and something happens that causes this prophage to excise out. What causes prophages to excise out of the genome is not always understood. We don't necessarily know what all those processes are or what signals a prophage to do that. It could be uh, bacteria specific, it could be uh, phage specific. Either way, the phage genome now excises itself out, but when it does it, it doesn't do it exactly where just the hot pink is. Instead, it extends that excision, the piece that's going to be cut out, it cuts in the wrong place. And in doing so, it ends up incorporating some of the host genome with it. So here in step three, we see the phage has moved into the lytic cycle. It's gone through uh, biosynthesis and maturation. And we now have new bacteriophages that contain phage DNA in addition to host DNA from its previous host. That host DNA happens to contain a gene for galactose. This new uh, bacteriophage goes out into the world and infects a new cell. It infects a new cell that does not have the ability to ferment galactose. And when it moves into a lysogenic phase, we can see in step five, it's going into a lysogenic state. And in step six, it's now a prophage, but this prophage contains not only a bacteriophage genome, but host genome. And in this lysogenic cell, once a cell is infected with the prophage, it's referred to as lysogenic. This lysogenic cell contains, basically contains DNA from three different sources. It has its own DNA, so that's one source. It has the phage DNA, that's the hot pink, because the phage did infect it and become a prophage. But it also contains a small piece of DNA from the host cell that this prophage was previously from. So it now has a gene for galactose metabolism. It couldn't metabolize galactose before the phage infection, and now it can due to the prophage insertion and being a lysogenic cell. So this process is a form of gene exchange. It did not result in any new cells, right? So it's horizontal gene exchange, but it is it is introducing new genetic material. So we have this horizontal gene exchange. It's just using a, a viral particle as, as a delivery method. Okay. Now in generalized transduction, that occurs in the lytic cycle. I'm going to go back a little bit to another slide, this one right here. And I want you to, to take a look. This was one of the first slides we looked at. Uh, take a look in the, at, at the, the cell all the way on the right. After, penetration, after attachment and penetration in the lytic cycle of a bacteriophage, it's going to 
it wants to take over this cell. Remember, this is a hostile takeover. So this phage takes over the cellular machinery and starts dedicating that all of those cellular proteins and enzymes to viral replication or to, to phage replication. If the host genome were to continue uh, being intact, some of those resources would be diverted to host genome. And the phage the phage, phages do not want that. So they're going to tear up or cut up the host genome. So the host chromosome essentially is chopped up into a bunch of pieces. And all those different pieces are kind of floating around in the cytoplasm. Remember, bacteria cells do not have nuclei. They don't have any kind of organelles. So everything's all floating around in one big package. So we have host de, uh, ho pieces of host DNA floating around. We have all these uh, extra copies of the phage DNA floating around. And then we have assembly and maturation of this all going on all in the same place. So we have bacteriophage proteins and parts and, and enzymes for assembly and all of that. It's all happening inside of this little tiny, this little tiny package. So sometimes in generalized transduction, there's a packaging error. And when the, the enzymes are packaging the genetic material into the capsid of the bacteriophage, instead of including viral DNA, they accidentally package one of those broken pieces of host DNA, of the bacterial DNA. And when the bacterial DNA gets packaged, sometimes that piece of DNA will contain a gene. Now this can be uh, packaged in addition to uh, uh, phage DNA, so you might have more than one type of DNA in there, but regardless of how it gets packaged, it gets packaged accidentally. It's not supposed to be in there. Now that particular virion, when it re is released, that particular bacteriophage upon maturation is released out into the environment, it is still capable of infecting another cell. And when it gets into the new cell, that genetic material will be injected into the new cell. And if it goes into a lysogenic state, then that bacterial DNA that accidentally got packaged will also be incorporated. And now this recipient cell, this second cell, will now have whatever characteristic is being introduced with that piece of DNA. So in lysogeny, we have uh, specialized transduction. It can only occur in the lysogenic cycle because it's that excision error. Then we have generalized transduction, which is a packaging error, and that occurs in the lytic cycle. All right, so let's go back to where we are. So that brings us to multiplication of animal viruses. In animal viruses, we have the same basic five steps, but we now we're up to six steps because we have to add one, and that is the process of uncoding. So let's take a look at these steps in order. I don't want to, I don't want to get too far ahead. All right, when animal viruses multiply, they also go through attachment. But how animal viruses attach to the surface of the, of the cell is very different. They are very spike and receptor dependent. So animal viruses are very, very picky about the cell, the species, as well as the type of cell that they're going to infect. Now, penetration of the virus into the cell can occur in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, we can have uh, what we call fusion where the, if it's an enveloped virus, the envelope of the virus will literally fuse or melt into the cell membrane and then drop down in the capsid itself will drop down into the, into the cell. Or we can have uh, what's called receptor mediated endocytosis. If you do not remember that from anatomy, you need to Google or YouTube uh, a quick video on receptor-mediated endocytosis so you understand how spikes and receptors play a role in the uptake of uh, viruses and other particles. But receptor-mediated endocytosis is um, kind of like a, a form of phagocytosis. Now, uh, after penetration, what gets taken up is the entire virus. So here, the capsid of the virus, that protein coat, does not get left behind like a bacteriophage. It actually enters into the cell. And a virus cannot take over a cell until its genetic material is into the cell. So animal viruses have to go through the additional step of uncoating. Uncoating occurs a multitude of different ways. I'm gonna give you a link to um, the yellow fever that kind of shows how that particular virus uncoats. 
Uh, it's really kind of fascinating. But uncoating occurs in a multitude of different ways, and it can be carried out by either uh, the, vir the virus brings its own enzymes, uh, or sometimes the host enzymes are used for it. But uncoating is removal of the capsid. Uh, and this is one additional step that animal viruses have to go through that bacteriophages do not. Of course, then we move into biosynthesis where the new nucleic acids and proteins get produced. Maturation is where everything assembles. The maturation of animal viruses in bacteriophages, maturation occurs inside of the cell prior to release. In animal viruses, maturation can occur inside of the cell prior to release or during release, such as an enveloped virus like the flu virus getting its, its uh, final envelope and spikes, or it can even occur after. Uh, HIV does not fully mature until after it is released from the host cell. So the maturation process in animal viruses is also a little more complex. How these viruses are released from the cell, majority of them are released through budding because most animal viruses tend to be enveloped. And this is uh, envelopes come from organelles or the cell membrane. But some that are non-enveloped viruses, such as uh, the norovirus, those actually release from cells by rupture. So the cell is lysed open and the mature virions are released all at once. So you can see we have kind of the same pattern of multiplication of animal viruses as we do in phages, but the mechanisms that are used in animal viruses are different. And you have to think about the structural differences between a eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic cell. Bacteria have cell walls. We don't have cell walls. Bacteria do not have organelles. We do have organelles. Bacteria don't have a lot of immunological properties. They have some but they don't really have much of an immune system. We do have a lot of, of immunological properties. So there are some major differences really due to cellular structure and, and cellular function. This is a uh, uh, picture. Your, your textbook also has a similar diagram where it really kind of just compares bacteriophages and viruses. You can pause this, this lecture and go through these differences if you want. All right, so let's look at the steps of uh, animal virus replication. Uh, animal viruses are not complex, or nearly as complex, I should say, as uh, bacteriophages. They don't have all of the extra parts, so assembly is a lot quicker for these guys. They do have on their surface attachment sites that are complementary to cell receptors. So they have very specific uh, cell receptors that they must attach to. The attachment sites will be distributed all across either the envelope, if it's an enveloped virus, or attached to the actual capsid. Attachment for animal viruses is usually only complete when multiple receptor sites are bound, and our cells have ways of moving receptor sites to the virus itself. The binding of one receptor will signal another and cause these receptors to kind of move towards each other to group, build a big complex. This is oftentimes referred to as a lipid raft. All right, so here we have uh, two pictures showing the two different ways that penetration occurs. We have at the top here, receptor-mediated endocytosis, and they're pointing out in this electron micrograph the virus and the attachment spikes. And you can see that these spikes are attaching to multiple receptors, and then over to the right, uh, we you can see one of the virus particles actually inside of an endosome. And that endosome is surrounded by a bunch of proteins called clathrins. It's referred to as a clathrin pit. And the clathrin pit is what is going to pull and create that endosome that'll contain that virus there. Now, that uh, clathrin pit is only going to be formed due to signaling from the receptors that were bound by the virus. So the virus spikes bind to receptors. The receptors send a signal to the cell to create this clathrin pit for endocytosis to occur. And this is why it is called receptor mediated endocytosis. Here the cell in, in receptor mediated endocytosis, the cell is purposely taking in uh, the virion. In fusion, it's a little bit different. 
We do still have some receptor binding because the, the virus is going to uh, have to be signaled for fusion to occur. But in this one, this is going to be an envel envelope, enveloped virus. And enveloped viruses, their membrane will fuse with the cell membrane of the host. And when they start fusing together, this will drop the capsid into a vesicle down into the actual um, cytoplasm. So you can see in this one, this is the entry of a herpes virus. And the herpes virus just kind of fuses its envelope with the envelope of the host cell. And once it gains entry in inside of the cell, the capsid is then released. The little uh, endosome kind of falls apart there. It's not a true endosome because there's no clathrin pit. So there's a big difference there between how these two enter. So these are the two different forms of entry or penetration of a virus into a cell. That is through receptor-mediated endocytosis or through fusion. Now, the uncoding process. The uncoding process occurs when the capsid is now inside of the cell. The capsid has to be removed in order for the genetic material of the virus to be released. So we get separation of the virus genome from the actual protein coat. This can occur a couple of different ways. It can oftentimes, the, the most common is that the capsid is digested by the host cell enzyme. So we some capsids, their capsomeres are composed of proteins that are digestible by enzymes we already have in our cells. There are others where viruses encode for their own digestive enzymes, and this would mean that the virus has to bring those enzymes with it. In animal viruses, we oftentimes see a couple of proteins in addition to the genetic material of the virus itself, and those proteins will be present in the capsid with the genetic material. And this is because these uh, enzymes, think of it as a, uh, instead of a BYOB party, it would be a BYOE party, bring your own enzyme. And these viruses bring these enzymes because the host cell doesn't make them. They are virus-specific enzymes. And the virus can't get things started. It can't start its infection or replication process without these enzymes. So it has to make them and package them with its genome so that when it travels to the next cell, it has those proteins available to it to get things, to get things started. The uncoding process itself, again, sometimes they, bring their, they, they use their own enzymes to digest or they'll use the host enzymes to digest. There are a couple, uh, when you look at that yellow fever virus, you're gonna see how it uncoats. It's really uh, virus specific. So there are other mechanisms, just those two are the most common. Now, biosynthesis. In biosynthesis, uh, DNA-containing viruses will have to replicate uh, their, all of their stuff in the uh, nucleus because eukaryotic cells do not have DNA in the cytoplasm. If DNA is present in the cytoplasm, the host cell will destroy it because it knows that it is foreign and all of our cells, all of our cells have the ability to destroy viral DNA inside of the cell. And we'll see how that occurs in the unit four in immunology. But DNA containing viruses, they have to replicate inside of the nucleus of the host because that's the only place that the viral DNA can survive. So these guys have got to gain entry into a cell. They got to get through the cytoplasm and somehow get their DNA into the nucleus of a host cell. RNA viruses can either complete their entire replication process in the cytoplasm, kind of like we'll see with a dengue virus infection, or if they have to go, if they're a retrovirus, retroviruses convert their RNA into DNA, they'll take care of that RNA uh, reverse transcription in, in the cytoplasm, but then the DNA will has to be transported into the nucleus. Uh, for transcription and translation. So we'll show you HIV virus, which is a, a retrovirus, how that works. Uh, so RNA viruses can either uh, convert into DNA and enter into the nucleus for replication, or they can complete all of their steps in the cytoplasm. The virus spikes that are part of the final envelope for enveloped viruses are usually transported to some host cell membrane for incorporation during release. For the dengue virus, I believe this occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum, 
in uh, uh, HIV, this occurs in the uh, cell membrane during the actual uh, cell membrane budding. Here's the dengue virus video. I'll give you, I'll uh, upload that for you in the folder. Now, how about release? Uh, release of an enveloped virus occurs through budding. Again, those viruses exit and they're going to take host membrane as their envelope. So most viral envelopes are composed of phospholipid bilayers. Those viral protein spikes are made during bio biosynthesis and embedded within the host membrane. Now this membrane can be the actual cell membrane. It could be the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum or the Golgi apparatus, some other organelle. It doesn't always have to be the actual cell membrane itself. Uh, there on the left, you see alpha virus. There's a, uh, that, that pink tissue there, pink cells. And that black arrow is showing where the alpha virus is actually being released and it's budding out of the cell. On the right, in blue, those are HIV viruses that are budding out of a uh, uh, T lymphocyte. So here's multiplication of a DNA virus. Uh, DNA virus here, you can see this is a papavirus, uh, kind of like uh, the human papillomavirus. And it attaches to the cell. In step two, it enters into the cell, starts encoding, making, going through its process. In step three, part of the viral DNA gets transcribed and it has to be, uh, notice it has to gain entry into the nucleus. So now we have viral DNA in the nucleus. Uh, when the viral DNA is inside of the nucleus, it is going to be transcribed into mRNA. mRNA is going to go out into the cytoplasm to meet up with ribosomes. Ribosomes are then going to, uh, are then going to synthesize new proteins. All of the capsomeres and, and all of the parts that are needed to make the capsid have to be taken back into the, the nucleus. That DNA, that viral DNA cannot enter the cytoplasm. The host cell will destroy it. So this guy has to, this virus here has to get its DNA into the nucleus, use the nuclear machinery to make RNA, use the cytoplasmic machinery with the RNA to make proteins, and then transport those proteins back into the nucleus of the cell. Assemble the capsid and genetic material inside of the cell and then allow this virus to bud out or release out into the cytoplasm and eventually outside of the cell so it can infect a new cell. So take a look at this diagram and see where, follow the genetic material and see how it has to go into the nucleus and then eventually it's going to come back out. Now retroviruses are RNA viruses and uh, RNA viral replication can oftentimes, uh, like you will see in the dengue virus video, that one isn't, that's an RNA virus and it takes place, uh, its replication process takes place entirely in the cytoplasm. Nothing ever enters into the nucleus. However, retroviruses are a little different. Now we know our central dogma, the, the uh, way that cells work is that DNA makes RNA makes proteins. It's referred to as the central dogma of biology. So DNA is transcribed into RNA, that is transcription. RNA is then translated into a protein, so that's translation. And retroviruses, when they enter into a cell, they deposit, they contain RNA. But their RNA has to be translated into, or excuse me, transcribed into DNA. These guys can't, they can't automatically uh, translated into a protein. They actually have to make DNA first. This is because these retroviruses, they go lysogenic. They actually become a, a provirus and the provirus will enter into the nucleus and uh, enter and embed itself into the host DNA and sit there. So it's very similar to the lysogenic cycle in bacteriophages. So here we have uh, like HIV here. This is a, a lentivirus. It's a, a reverse transcription. So our virus enters into the cell, releases its viral RNA into the cytoplasm. It brings with it an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase will reverse transcribe RNA into DNA. 
the DNA will then enter into the nucleus and incorporate itself into the host DNA. So I now have a provirus. The provirus can sit for days, weeks, months, uh, or it can immediately go into transcription translation, but when it goes into transcription translation, it doesn't leave the host genome. Bacteriophage lysogeny, the viral genetic material had, the, the phage genetic material had to leave the host genome. But here, in proviral infections, it does not. It can remain in the host genome for an extended period of time. And it can either be dormant and just sit there and not do anything, or it can go directly into replication. It just stays within the, within the host cell. Now, what's unique about this is that the host DNA remains intact. So the host cell can survive for an extended period of time because it's not shutting off all of the cell's processes. It's just simply including itself into the cell's processes. So these viral infected cells can survive for an extended period of time while biosynthesis and maturation is occurring. So in step five there, we have transcription of the provirus and to RNA, and this RNA is gonna get shipped out into the um, cytoplasm. Some of that RNA is going to encode for proteins for the capsid. Others are just copies of the RNA. And we move into the maturation process where the new capsid is formed, viral spikes are encoded for, all of the different parts of the virus are made, and eventually in step seven there, you can see in maturation and release, we have our virus bud out of the cell, and it's now able to start at step one again and move and infect a new cell. So uh, viral replication of, of retroviruses is, uh, has a couple of extra steps because of that reverse transcription that must occur. Retroviruses must bring reverse transcriptase with them because we don't make reverse transcriptase. We don't reverse transcribe our RNA into DNA. Another thing to keep in mind is that uh, retroviruses become proviruses. They incorporate into the host DNA. When a virus inserts its genome into our genome, it is now considered what's known as an oncogenic virus. Oncogenic viruses are viruses that are associated with the development of cancer. So cancer, we know, is an accumulation of genetic mutations. When these proviruses insert their DNA into our DNA, they can cause mutations. And when these mutations occur, if they change, depending on where insertion occurs, these viruses are oftentimes associated with development of cancer. Think about the Gardasil vaccine. The Gardasil vaccine is a vaccine against the human papilloma virus. Human papilloma virus, or HPV, is a virus that infects cervical cells and is highly associated with cervical cancer. So people get, uh, women and men now, we know it um, actually infects all kinds of mucous membrane cells, but you get vaccinated against the HPV virus, not because the virus makes you ill, but because the virus is associated with cancer. So if we can prevent infection by that virus, we can destroy that virus before it can gain entry into cells, then that person will be protected. Okay, next we're gonna watch a quick video on HIV infection, it, uh, how a retrovirus infects a cell. This video is working inside of here, uh, inside this recording. So I'm gonna go ahead and allow it to play. And I want you to just pay attention to uh, the actual process itself. Don't worry about the names of everything. That's um, the co-receptors and all that. I'm not worried about that. I just want you to get an idea of the general process of how these guys actually have to replicate and reverse transcribe and uh, move into the host genome and that sort of thing. HIV infects cells via two cell surface molecules. CD4 is the primary receptor for the virus, while the chemokine receptors CCR5 and CXCR4 act as co-receptors for the viral infection of macrophages and T cells respectively. HIV binds initially to CD4 via the envelope glycoprotein GP120. Interactions of the virus with CD4 and the co-receptor 
allow virus uncoding and the entry of the nucleocapsid containing the viral genome into the cell. The viral reverse transcriptase, which is an integral part of the viral particle, copies the RNA genome of HIV into double-stranded DNA. The viral integrase then mediates the integration of the viral DNA into the chromosomal DNA of the host cell. In this state, the virus is latent. That is, it can persist in the cell in an inactive state. Reactivation of the virus occurs when the host cell becomes activated and viral transcription is initiated. This results in the accumulation of viral proteins as well as genome-length RNA transcripts of the virus. Viral proteins assemble at the cell membrane with copies of the RNA genome and bud off to create a new viral particle. Maturation of this new virus particle continues after it is budded off from the host cell to create a new infectious virion with its characteristic nucleocapsid morphology. Okay, so that brings us to the idea of cancer. Uh, you can see since retroviruses insert their genome into the host genome, this can cause some type of mutation. And in humans, there are two very specific classes of genes that are associated with, uh, with cancer development due to these oncogenic viruses. So we first have what are called proto-oncogenes, sometimes just called oncogenes. And onco we know means cancer, right? When you, if someone has cancer, they go to a doctor called an oncologist. Uh, so activation of oncogenes can cause cells to transform from healthy normal cells into cancerous cells. Now oncogenes are human genes that are usually associated with uh, increased rate of growth. The faster cells divide or go through mitosis, and the more quickly they move through the cell cycle, the more likely they are to start developing mutations. And a couple of things happen to cells that are transformed. So if an oncogene is activated due to insertion of the genetic material into the host genome, this can cause activation of an oncogene these cells will lose contact inhibition, so that's where metastasis can occur. They can um, start expressing uh, very tumor-specific antigens on their surface. This is so cells will start clumping together and uh, adhering together more tightly. They will signal other cells to start dividing very rapidly, so they'll begin skipping, skipping some of the proofreading steps in in the cell cycle so that the genetic material doesn't get proofread as well. Without proofreading, more mistakes will occur and um, not be corrected and mutations will continue to develop. So this is directly due to the material of oncogenic viruses being integrated into the host DNA. So oncogenes are genes that if those genes are turned on, if they're activated, a cell will move into what's referred to as cell proliferation. Uh, they will, they will start dividing far too rapidly and those genes activate uh, the induction of mutations. On the opposite spectrum, already activated in the human genome are many genes called tumor suppressor genes. Tumor suppressor genes are what are responsible for a lot of our cells' personal space, uh, keeping cells on the extracellular matrix as opposed to too closely attached to each other if they're not supposed to be. And the loss of function of a tumor suppressor gene often leads to tumor formation. So we already have in our genome genes that are, uh, produce proteins that help prevent tumors from forming. But if we get insertion of genetic material or some kind of mutation to the actual tumor suppressor gene itself, then that gene is no longer going to function. And we will lose that uh, prevention that preventative measure and the cell can, the cell can start um, recruiting other cells and attaching more closely to each other and we can start seeing tumor formation. So the two genes associated with uh, cancer are two human genes that are most commonly associated with cancer development due to oncogenic virus infection are a class uh, are classes of oncogenes or proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. 
Here we have just a list of the different oncogenic viruses, uh, adenoviridase, herpes, pox, papaviridase, hepadenoviridase. One thing to note is retroviruses, all retroviruses are considered oncogenic. And that is because a retrovirus must insert its genetic material into the genome of the host. So all retroviruses are oncogenic. Not all oncogenic viruses are retroviruses, but all retroviruses are oncogenic. And this is just a few examples of some of the different uh, retroviral and oncogenic viruses out there. So that brings us to prions. Prions are infectious proteins. They can be inherited, they can be ingested, they can be um, transplanted. Uh, sometimes uh, prions are spread through surgery because of surgical instrumentation. And this is because prions are long-term progressive. They're without, uh, they're difficult to diagnose. They're pretty rare. And uh, someone can oftentimes be infected by a prion for a long period of time and not know it. So surgical transmission can be an issue. Now, Prions became famous back in the, I want to say, early 2000s when there was a mad cow outbreak in the United Kingdom. And prions most often affect the nervous system. And they are, it's a class of diseases known as spongiform encephalopathies. These are uh, encephalitis, which is swelling of the brain. And one of the characteristics on a autopsy or necropsy is that the brain itself, after infection by a prion, looks like a sponge. It has a lot of little holes and plaques in it. There are a couple of different spongiform encephalopathies. There's sheep scrapies, which affects sheep. There's kutzfeld jakobs disease, which is actually sheep scrapies in humans. There's gerstmann straussler schenker syndrome, which is inherited. There's another inherited one called fatal familial insomnia, where people are, are incapable of reaching REM sleep. Uh, most people who are born with fatal familial insomnia will usually pass away by their early to mid thirties. Their brains just can't handle it. They, the only way that they can achieve REM sleep is chemically with, with sleeping medication. And that's not a natural REM sleep. Then we have, of course, mad cow disease, the most famous of them all. And mad cow disease is the bovine form of sheep scrapies. So cattle develop sheep scrapies and those cattle are then butchered and sold on the market as steak and and London broil and ground beef, and people who eat it then consume the prion and they develop kutzfeld jakobs disease. Now, the sheep prion that causes all of this, it's called sheep scrapies, and it's uh, normally in, it, it, in the gene for it in, encodes for a cellular protein. It's a signaling protein found on the surface of nerve cells in sheep, on their brain cells. And the scrapies protein can sometimes turn into a prion and it'll start accumulating in the brain cells and form these plaques and cause uh, irregular behavior uh, in, in sheep. It's been around for years and years. They've known about it in sheep. Um, but at one point in time in the early 2000s, they wanted to make cattle bigger or they wanted to give them more muscle. So they started feeding them a high protein diet. And in order to get that protein, they took what's called sheep offal, O-F-F-A-L, which is the brain and spinal cord of sheep. And it's very high in protein. So they would pull out the brain and spinal cord in sheep that were being butchered for, for food, and they would dry it and grind it up and put it in cattle feed. And they put it in cattle feed to try and increase the protein content of the feed for the cattle to try and increase musculature for, for bigger cattle for sale. And these cattle started developing neurological symptoms and it took a while, uh, quite a while to figure out what was going on and it was spreading from cow to cow, entire farms were being infected. It was really very scary, it happened very quickly and the UK lost billions of dollars over a couple of years. It is the reason why today when you go through customs, sometimes they still um, ask you to take your shoes off when you're coming into the country or to walk through tape or things like that. They might ask you if you visited farms, those sorts of things. And all of that is because of this mad cow disease, this prion disease. Now, the problem was that there were this, these cattle, before it was caught, many cattle were butchered and sold in grocery stores as beef 
And some there are several people who in England developed Critzfield Jakobs disease because they eat ate beef from that um, from that mad cow outbreak. Majority of those people are no longer alive now. Uh, Critzfield Jakobs disease is a long-term progressive neurological disease uh, and is not pleasant. There is no cure and there's really not, not much of a treatment. So the, the ultimate idea or the ultimate lesson from this, eat more chicken. Ha <laughs> ha. All right, now that brings us to plant viruses. Uh, plant viruses are usually viroids, but they can be regular uh, uh, viruses as well. They enter through wounds or by insects. So they actually have to be injected into the plant cells because remember plant cells like bacteria cells actually have cell walls. So the, the cell walls have to be broken in order for a virus to be able to enter into it. Uh, viroids are infectious RNA. Here on the right, this is an actual electron micrograph of a viroid that causes potato spindle uh, tuber. And this is what destroyed the potato crop or uh, caused the potato famine in Ireland that brought um, a large population of Irish here to the United States. Uh, it's actually why my family is here today. So uh, thank you. Thank you to potato spindle tuber viroid for, uh, for bringing my ancestors over here. Anyway, these are naked pieces of RNA. They don't have capsids or envelopes or anything like that. And they are most often introduced through uh, injury or by uh, insects. All right, the rest of this slideshow is virus families. I am not going to test you on all of the different virus families. We're not gonna go over this. I provided these uh, last couple of slides. Uh, there's about 15 of them. Um, these last 15 or 20 slides as uh, uh, some notes for your nursing program. You are going to have to know some of these viruses for that. So this just kind of gives you an idea of the families of viruses, right? So we've got parvoviridae and some of the different diseases that are associated with those viruses. It's a good idea to kind of go through them on your own and take a look at um, the different classes of viruses, but I am not going to test you on all of these. So I'm not going to go through a whole big long recorded lecture. This uh, recording is long enough. So there you have your chapter 13 virus lecture. I hope that it is helpful and I hope to see you guys in some of the reviews. I will post copies of the videos as well as any information about any online reviews that are going to occur for this, this lecture. Good luck on your exam and let me know if you have any questions.